everyone and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the life cycle of a machine learning problem, all the way from data collection to a system's deployment. In later videos, we'll be talking about specific models and the math behind them, but it's always important to keep in mind the context that we'll be discussing in this video. Let's say you want to build an app for your friends. From a photo of them, you want to predict whether or not they're sad, and based on this, offer suggestions like a prompt to chat with a friend or to receive a cute picture. We'll use this as a running example to illustrate all the steps involved in building a machine learning system and potential concerns and ethical questions that could arise. The first thing that we need to do is problem definition. Often, we assume that the problem comes predefined, but it's important to acknowledge the limitations and assumptions that we make with any problem definition. In our example, we've defined our problem as a binary classification task where we take a picture of a person and output a classification of sad or not sad. When we do this, we are assuming that people exhibit one dominant emotion and sacrificing performance on images where people are perhaps a mix of emotions. In addition, our entire premise rests on the assumption that we can infer emotion, like sadness, from people's photographs. While this might seem intuitive, it's an assumption that might have consequences that we should examine. Throughout this video, we'll give an overview of the steps in the machine learning lifecycle, as we go, we'll be adding each step to this overall diagram so you can see the full picture. The next thing we need to talk about is data. When people talk about machine learning problems, they often refer to data as an unchangeable object that already exists, ready to be fed into a model. However, the process of collecting data is actually a really important step in the machine learning pipeline. And as you'll see, all the different decisions that you have to make when collecting data can end up having a pretty big effect on your model's results. To collect data, the first thing you'll need to do is define a population. Assuming the data set you are collecting is about people, you'll need to ask a lot of questions here. Who are you collecting data from or about? What parts of the world do they represent, and how similar or different are they? How many people are you going to consider? This matters because your model will try to pick up patterns from the data. And if your population isn't representative, it could end up performing poorly for some people when you actually deploy it. Next, you need to actually measure things about this population. In our example, we want to make predictions from a person's photo, so we'll need to collect images of the people in our population. At this step, it's important to consider things like whether the quality of images is consistent across the population. You will also need to decide whether you want to include other information, like people's ages or locations. You'll also need to collect labels, or measurements that tell you whether the people in these images are actually sad or not. There are many ways you could go about getting this information. Perhaps you could administer a survey when you take people's photo, or maybe you could have external people decide and hand label them. Both of these choices might introduce a different type of noise or error that you should be aware of. Additionally, in order to effectively learn the difference between sad and not sad faces, you'll need to make sure that you have enough examples from both the positive class, in this case, sad, and the negative class, in this case, not sad. Next, you'll want to pre-process your data. These steps will be different depending on what type of data you're using, but in our case, for example, since we have images, we might want to reformat them to be the same resolution and size. It's possible that you could get a hold of all of this data through an external source, rather than collecting it yourself. For example, you might happen to find a dataset of faces online that are labeled as smiling or not, and you could repurpose their labels to the labels that you need by making some assumptions about how smiling or not smiling in a photo relates to mood. Even if you find the dataset all ready to just download from the internet, somebody somewhere collected that data and you should still ask all the same questions about their data collection method and whether it's well suited to your task. In practice, problem definition and data collection might happen in a different order. For example, if you find a dataset online, you might modify your problem definition based on what's feasible to do with that data. Let's say you've gone through all these steps or have found an existing dataset and labels to use. You'll now need to split up your data into training, validation, and testing datasets. Usually, we keep the majority of the data for training. Validation data is used during development to check how the model is doing on data it hasn't seen during training. And then testing data is kept aside until the final model is done training 
to get a metric of how it performs on unseen data that did not affect it at all. The next step is to define a model. If you had time series data, for example, you'll probably choose a model that can specifically deal with sequential relationships. In our case, with image data, we'll want to choose a model that is designed to pick up important features of images. One example of such a model is a convolutional neural network. We'll go into the specifics of many types of models in upcoming videos. The model you choose has implications for how well you can pick up intricacies in the data. For example, you don't want to choose too simple a model for complex data, or too large a model for a small amount of low-dimensional data. Once we've defined our model and our training data, we can actually train the model. Different models have different optimization procedures. For example, neural networks use a method called backpropagation to learn parameters that best fit the training data. We can compare performances on the validation data to help make choices about what flavor of model to use and how long to train for. Once the model is trained, we can report its final performance on the test data, and we might choose to report its performance on other public datasets, which are called benchmark datasets. Using benchmark datasets makes it easier to compare your model to others, but it's important to keep in mind all the same questions and concerns about data collection that we talked about earlier for benchmark datasets. We also have to choose what performance metrics to use. In an earlier video, we introduced false positive and false negative rates, which are a few among many possible metrics, all of which have different implications and advantages, and affect how the model will be used. In our example, we might not mind false positives, since it would just ask a couple extra people to look at cute pictures, whereas we might care more about missing people who might actually be sad, so we might choose to pay special attention to the false negative rate. Before deploying a model, we have to decide whether we are satisfied with its final performance. Here, it's important to look at metrics for different subgroups who might be using it, which will help us make sure that the model performs equally well across all groups of people. For example, if most of the data you collected was of women, then your model that learns from this data might perform poorly on your friends of other genders, and you want to catch this before actually giving the app to your friends. In a real-world setting, once a model is ready to be deployed, there are a lot of practical implementation questions that are critical to make sure the model is actually used correctly and effectively. For systems that are meant to be used by humans, for example, how will the model predictions be visualized? In our case, we'll need to think about how people are going to upload their pictures in the app. Are they going to take selfies? Will we need to adjust for lighting? And we might also want to have a way for people to report if their picture is incorrectly classified and find a way to integrate this feedback back into the model. Let's say that the app is really popular amongst your friends and you want to scale it up and distribute to more people. You'll need to ask many of these questions we brought up again for your new population. For example, all of your friends and the data you collected might be people in a certain age range, but if people who are older or younger start using the app, will it work as well for them? And maybe now that this app affects more people, you'll want to talk to and incorporate the opinion of more stakeholders in these decisions. In addition, so far we've operated under the assumption that you're using this model with friends who are opting into it and have consented to their images being used in this way. If you scale it up, you'll need to make sure that all the people this app will affect have all the information about how their data will be used and stored and are able to consent to this. When the system starts operating in the real world, we want to continue monitoring it and making sure that it's actually having the positive impact that we expected. If not, we might need to go back and reevaluate our problem definition, our data, or the way that the system works. In general, when systems are deployed in the world, they change things. Old problems might no longer be relevant, or new problems might arise that prompt new systems to be built. As you can see, there are a lot of considerations that go into a machine learning system, whether you're the one actually collecting the data or the one deciding whether or not to deploy the system, there are consequences to each step. 
As we go into more detail into specific models and methods, in later videos, we hope that you keep this context in mind and remember that a particular model or method is just one part of a much larger societal process. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching. This is a really important video to understand machine learning as a whole and we really enjoyed filming it. If you like this video, please leave a like, a comment, or a subscribe and always let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Thanks! thanks.